We begin in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. There was a young Muslim college student flying out from LAX a little over a week ago. And he was on the phone with his dad. And I want you to put yourself in his shoes. He says to his dad, I'll be there in a few hours, inshallah. And if you've been around Muslims, you know that inshallah, mashallah, subhanallah, are things we say when we want to bless a sentence. And indeed, he did not make it home that night. God did not will it. But what happened was, someone heard him saying, Inshallah, and called the flight attendants, and called the pilots, and called the airport, and they denied him boarding that plane. Like any other citizen, but he was denied to board that plane, dear brothers and sisters, just a little bit over a week ago, because he was Muslim, who used the word, Inshallah. The Coachella bombings, the politicians saying that Muslims cannot hold high places in office, that they could not see a Muslim as a president, and that a Muslim shouldn't be a president. The Chapel Hill massacres, and more recently, the two couple that were shot in San Jose in their own home murdered, the two Muslim couples that I'm sure you've heard about. In fact, I had a student from the MSA call me this morning asking if he could have permission to leave so he could go and pray the Janazah prayer. And I'm not here to give you bad news or to make you feel depressed about it because that's not what we do as Muslims. In fact, I'm here to give you hope about it. Through the story of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in the trench. We all know of the story of the trench, uh, the, the, the battle of the trench, al khandaq or uh, Al-Ahzab. Now this story is very well known. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gathered all of the companions. May the peace and blessings be upon him and them. And he gathered them all and he said, we're being attacked from Mecca. There was an army of people coming from Mecca. Their entire purpose was to destroy Islam. Because Islam was still a few numbers. And he gathered them all together. And a man by the name of Salman al-Farisi, he was from Persia. And he was enslaved, and he went searching for Islam, and he found it in Arabia. He actually left, and as he was going down, he found Buddhism first, then he found Hinduism, then he found Islam, and he converted to Islam. He went to search for the deen. That's why converts have much more love for the deen, I believe. We have to revive our hearts like the hearts of the converts when it comes to Islam. Islam is a gift given to us every single day. So going to his story, he says, we used to have this tactic in Persia, where we would dig a trench, a khandaq, around the area that we wanted to protect. In Medina, if, you know, uh, if you've been there, it's surrounded by mountains from behind it. But it, from the front, it's exposed. So they dug a trench around that area. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was with them in the trenches. When we, when we talk about leaders that are with their people, we say they were with them in the trenches. He was literally with them in the trenches, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, digging with them. And the Muslims didn't even have much food to go around at this time. That's why the Meccans, they thought they could destroy Islam at this point. And as Allah says, يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يُطْفِئُ نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ This is in the Qur'an. They want to extinguish the light of Islam from earth. But Allah is the one who sparks that light. And that light will continue despite what they want to do. And before I continue, I want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up on something. Called Islamophobia. Islamophobia is a $42 million industry in the West. There are seven organizations, $42 million, funded simply for the purpose of demonizing Muslims in the West. The reason you didn't hear about these two beautiful couple on, on the news, as much as you would hear about it if it was the Muslims shooting, was because they've demonized Muslims to where when it's a victim that is a Muslim, the media could care less. When the person shot is a Muslim, or an African American, or a minority, the media could care less. But when it's the other way around, it's pushed in front of us, in front of our eyes, for us to comment on, to tweet about, thinking we're doing something, but we're really just feeding the fire. So Salman al-Farisi, he tells them about this tactic to dig the trench. They dig the trench. And the beautiful story, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was so hungry. And when we say Sallallahu Alaihi it just means peace and blessings be upon him for those visiting. And he was so hungry that 
they saw his tunic go up and they saw that he had tied rocks to his stomach. So he could not think, so he would not think about hunger. And one of the companions, his name was Jabir ibn Abdullah. He saw this. He saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tied a rock to his belly so he could push his stomach inward so he wouldn't feel hunger, so he could keep working in the trenches. And he went to his home and he asked his family, he said, do we have something to feed the Prophet? So Allah Alaihi Wasallam went. And his wife looked and said, yes, we have something, but don't tell anyone about it because we don't have enough to feed more than one person. And so Jabir ibn Abdullah goes to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he whispers in his ear and he says, Ya Rasulullah, come to my home for something real quick. And the Prophet smiles, puts his hand in the hand of Jabir, takes his pickaxe, because they were digging, and he hits the rock and he says, I see Syria has become free. And he hits it again and he says, I see Byzantine has become free. And he's giving them hope and he's giving them optimism. And he's giving them all this hope. And he takes Jabir's hand and he, he tells all the companions, everyone come to Jabir's house. We're eating at Jabir's house. And so Jabir, he says, one second. He runs back home and he goes to his wife and he says to her, the whole entire army is coming. And she says, I told you not to invite anyone but the Prophet. He said, it wasn't me. It was the Prophet Muhammad. He invited everyone. And then look at the faith of this believer. She said, if the Prophet invited them, then don't worry. Bring them. And indeed, they were all quenched, kind of like the miracle of Jesus salam, when he passed around the cup and they all drank from it. This is the belief. I mean, we don't, we don't see miracles anymore because we don't believe in miracles anymore. So dear brothers and sisters, this story brings us to where we are now. We're in the trenches right now. And we just need to have hope. We just need to have hope that despite all of what's going on and demonization that's going on, that we focus on the good that people are doing. That we focus on the millions of Muslims that are trying their best to make Islam give the proper message to the world. So for example, when we had the peace rally here at the masjid, and the mayor, the mayor was here, and people came to this mosque, and people still come to the mosque, and people still want to know that every time something happens, our neighbors respond. That it's important for us to know that when the KKK wanted to rally in Anaheim, everyone stood up against it. And this is what we need to do. Focus on the good, dear brothers and sisters. Acknowledge what's going on, but also focus on the good. And I have practical solutions, things we have to do and need to do to actually make that good come about. And the first thing is, one, focus on the good, thank the people that are working hard, and two, build institutions and support institutions that do these things. You all know Dr. King, you've heard of Malcolm X, Al-Hajj, Malik Shabazz, may Allah have mercy on him. These people, they did not dismantle the racist ideologies alone. They had institutions behind them. And so this is what we need to do. And I want to start by something. And this isn't a fundraiser. This is your first institution right here. This masjid. This is the core. This mosque is the core institution that you have to support. And if you're a teacher, come teach at the mosque. If you're, if you're well, you don't have to be that wealthy to, to, to fund to the mosque, to give to the mosque. And here's another thing. They've done, they've done tests and studies. And this test they, they did was uh, by care. They wanted to see how many, how much percent of the Muslim community is active. I want you to pay attention with me here because this part is really important. They said that only 2% of the 6 million Muslims in the United States are active. That they're actually active in their community. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that coming to the mosque is counted as active? No, it's not. You coming to the mosque is an obligation. It's for you. And for those who came early, you got better good deeds. Those who came late, get less. That's, that's a, between you and Allah. You come into the mosque, it's not what activism is. This is between you and God. Activism is what are we doing for our faith? And it's not going to just change by this, po this podium here. This is just one way. Now, that's not to dis disregard, again, going to the first point, we have to acknowledge those that are doing good. The MSAs, the ICNAs, the MAS, the Y Islams, all the organizations that are doing such things, you have to acknowledge and support them. And so these are the practical things that we can do, dear brothers and sisters, in this time. Because we're in a very crucial and critical time. So I leave you with these thoughts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten our minds, give us peace of mind and thinking.